So let me start off by explaining the weakest separation axiom, which is called T0. So um, we say that a topological space x tau, where x is some non-empty set and tau is the set of open sets, we say that that is T0 when we have this property that for each pair of points in the space that are distinct, we have the either there's going to be an open set capital A that contains little a but not little b or there's going to be an open set capital A that does not contain little a but does contain little b so um, Basically, a topological space has T0 when, given any pair of distinct points, we can always find an open set which contains one of those points, but not the other. So, diagrammatically, it'd be something like this. Given a pair of points A and B, we can find some open set containing A, but not B. Okay, then. So, this is the... Uh, easiest to satisfy a separation axiom but um, it's not so interesting as some of the others so let's quickly move on to the next one which is T1 so um, let's give the definition here so if we just scroll down a bit We say that a topological space x tau is T1 when for every point in that space, every point little x, um, we have that the set which just contains little x is a closed set. So in other words, a space is T1 when every singleton set is a closed set of that topology. Okay, so this is actually a stronger condition than T0. So now we come to our first theorem. Which says that. If X tau is T1. then x tau is t0. So um, it would be good if you could pause the video now and see if you can work out what the proof to this is. It's not terribly difficult. Okay, so what's the proof of this result? Well, we're going to assume that our topological space is t1. and now let's just suppose that we have a pair of points, distinct points, A and B. Now, since the space is T1, we're going to have the, the set which just contains A has to be closed. So now what we're going to do is we're going to define this set capital A to be equal to the complement of that set that just contains A. So in other words, it's equal to the set of all members of X, not equal to A. Now that's the complement of a closed set, so that has to be open. And moreover, we're going to have that B is going to be a member of that set capital A. 
and also A is obviously not a member of it. And so we've proved our result, because given our generic pair of distinct points, we found an open set that contains one, but not the other. And so we have that our space has to be T0. So T1 implies T0. OK, then. So now let's have a look at some examples to solidify these concepts. OK, so a fairly simple example is the discrete space. for some non-empty set x. So recall that the discrete space is the space which has um, the set of all subsets as the set of open sets. So every single subset of x is considered to be an open set in the discrete space. So in other words, tau is just equal to the power set of x. Now, um, I claim that this is a T1 space. And I'd like you to pause the video and see if you can prove it. It has a one line proof. OK. Right. So the proof is basically just that. Um, for every. Element of this space, so little a, we have that um, because the space is T1, the set that just contains A is closed. So the reason that this set just containing A is closed is because the complement of that, the set of elements outside of A, or not equal to A, has to be open. Why does it have to be open? Because it's a subset of capital X, and every subset of capital X is an open set in the discrete space. So there we have it. The set containing any particular element is closed. So the discrete space is indeed T1. And also, of course, it must be T0, because T1 implies T0. Right. So another example we can have a look at uh, is the indiscrete space. So suppose we have the indiscrete space which has at least two elements in the set. So we're going to insist that capital X has at least two elements. What about this? Is this T0? Is this T1? Well, I'll leave you to think about it. I claim that it's not even T0. But you can have a think about this and see if you can prove it. Now we're going to think about um, a more interesting kind of topology. So let x be some infinite set. And let tau be the finite closed topology. Excuse me, finite closed topology on X. So just to remind you, the finite closed topology is such that the Closed sets of the topology are precisely the finite sets of finite subsets of X. Okay, so a set is closed if and only if it's a finite subset of X or if it's equal to X itself. The set itself is always closed, of course. Now, um, in this case, I claim that x tau is t1. So uh, perhaps you can think about this and come up with a proof. 
because I'm going to tell you the proof now. It's very straightforward. Suppose we have an element of x. Well, the set just containing that element is going to be finite. Since it's finite, it's closed. So we just have that every singleton subset is closed. That's all we need. And so that means that the space is indeed T1. Okay, so as a challenge then, I'd like you to try and find a topological space which is T0 but not T1. So it is possible, and it's a fairly interesting problem. So I'll give you a little hint, well, it's actually quite a big hint, and that is that you can do it when x is equal to the set that just contains 0 and 1. Okay? So if you want to pause the video and have a go at it, then so be it. I'll tell you the answer now. So the answer is that if we just pick the topology where the open sets are the empty set, the set that just contains 1, and the whole set 0, 1, that is what we need. So um, this is actually called the Sierpinski space. See if I can spell Sapinski. There we go. And we can just draw a little diagram of it like this. We have point zero on one. We have an open set which doesn't contain any points, that's the empty set. We have an open set that contains both of the points. And we have an open set that just contains point 1. So you can see that this is T1 because we only have two points. And this little open set here um, contains 1 but not 0. So it contains one point but not the other. However, um, the set that just contains 0 is not closed. So it's not a T1 space, but it is a T0 space. Okay, so our next separation axiom is quite a lot more interesting and it pops up in a lot of places because it's very powerful. Um, so we call it quite predictively T2, but it's also called the Hausdorff condition. So A topological space, we say a topological space is T2, or sometimes we say it is Hausdorff, when for each pair of distinct points, in X, we have that there exists open sets, capital A and capital B, which kind of separate the points in the sense that one of the points belongs to A and one of the points belongs to B. 
and capital A and capital B do not intersect, so that our intersection is empty. So that's our condition for a space to be T2 or Hausdorff. It is that any distinct pair of points um, can be associated with non-intersecting open sets, which they're contained within respectively. So, okay, can we have some examples of Hausdorff spaces? Well, there's a really large and important set of examples. But just before I get on to the important examples, let me discuss a rather trivial one, just to illustrate the concept. So, for some non-empty set X, the discrete space is T2. Um, again, maybe you'd like to have a go at proving this. The proof is fairly straightforward. Just that for any pair of points, which are distinct, if we just let capital A be the set that contains one of the points, and uh, capital B to be the set that contains the other points, then of course our conditions are going to be satisfied. Because these two points won't intersect. And that's it. Okay then, so now I'm going to talk about a really massive and important class of Hausdorff spaces. So we've been talking about metric spaces in previous lectures. So a metric space, if you remember, is basically just a set which can be associated with a kind of distance function d, which satisfies various uh, conditions that makes it act kind of like distance. And um, we also talked about how metric spaces induce topologies. So if you have a metric space, uh, xd, well then, for any particular point in that space, say a, we can talk about the open ball about a which is the set of all points, say for epsilon, it's the set of all points within a distance of epsilon of A. So, the set of all B belonging to the space, such that the distance from A to B is less than epsilon. Okay, that's our definition of the open ball. And if we take our topological basis to be the set of all open balls, around all points, then that's going to induce a particular topology uh, on our set. So we'll call that x tau. So the open sets are the unions of open balls. And um, so we see that our metric space induces a topological space. And so in general, we can take a topological space and we can ask ourselves, is this topological space induced by some kind of metric? So this gives us a definition. Um, we say a topological space is metricizable. when there exists, uh, so let's say it's topological space x tau, when there's a metric d on x, um, which induces this topological space. 
in this manner, okay? So it turns out then that each metricizable space is Hausdorff. In other words, if we have a topological space which is induced by some metric D, then that's going to be a T2 space. Let's prove it. So our theorem is that each metricizable space x tau is T2. Let's prove it. Well, suppose we've got our metric space x tau, xd, sorry, which induces this topological space. Well, now let's take a pair of distinct points from x. And now what we want to do to show that this space is T2, or Hausdorff, is we want to find open sets about each of these points which don't intersect. So um, remember we have this distance function D. So we can consider the distance D between A and B. And let's give that a name. Let's call that epsilon. Well, since A and B are distinct points, there must be a positive distance between them. So we have that epsilon is some positive real. Um, and so now what we can do is we can consider the open ball around these different points. So um, in particular, we'll think about the open ball um, of all points within epsilon over 2 of A. And we'll also think about the open ball um, of points within epsilon over 2 of B. So these are going to be open sets. Open balls with respect to a metric are always going to be open sets in the topology induced by that metric. And all we have to do now is to show that these two sets don't intersect. So what we want to do is to show that these two open balls do not intersect. So we're going to do that by contradiction. Well, suppose instead that these two open balls do intersect. So suppose that there is a point C which belongs to the epsilon over 2 open ball around A and also belongs to the epsilon over 2 ball around B. So in other words, we're supposing there's a point C within epsilon over 2 of A and epsilon over 2 of B. Now, we can get a contradiction. So what is the distance from, sorry, before we go on, let's get some implications of this. So what does this imply? Well, it implies that the distance from A to C has to be less than epsilon over 2. And it also implies that the distance from C to B has to be less than epsilon over 2. So now, let's consider the distance from A to B. Well, we can use the triangle inequality to say that that has to be less than or equal to the distance from A to C plus the distance from C to B. And we just said that um, 
this thing here is epsilon less than epsilon over 2, and this thing here is epsilon over 2. So this quantity has to be less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is equal to epsilon. So here we get our contradiction then. Because what we have here is that the distance from A to B has to be less than epsilon. But if you remember up here, we actually define the distance from A to B as equal to epsilon. So this is our contradiction right here. And this contradiction came about because we made this assumption here that there was a point which belonged to both of these epsilon over 2 balls simultaneously. So that assumption cannot be true. And so indeed, we have that the epsilon over 2 ball about A intersection with the epsilon over 2 ball about B is equal to the empty set. So we've found our open sets around A and B, which don't intersect. And so that shows that this space is Hausdorff or, two, or T2. So we have that every metric space uh, corresponds to a Hausdorff space. So we have lots of examples now of Hausdorff spaces. For example, um, n-dimensional Euclidean space is a Hausdorff space. Now, a word of warning is that the converse of this is not true. You can find examples of Hausdorff spaces which are not metricizable. And actually, this is a rather challenging sort of cutting edge subject. Um, the study of when particular Hausdorff spaces are metricizable uh, is still ongoing. Okay then, so let's continue to prove our sort of results about the hierarchy of these separation axioms. So our next result then is that each T2 space, each Hausdorff space, is T1. So how do we prove that? Perhaps you'd like to pause the video and have a go. Well, suppose we have a point in a point X in our space. Now we want to show you that this is the set containing X is closed. Okay, so um, what we're going to do if we consider another point Y which is not equal to X Well, since our space is T2, we can find a couple of open sets, which we're going to call AXY and BXY. Um, which kind of separate these points. So X is a member of AXY and Y is a member of BXY. Uh, but these two open sets, I should say that they're open. Oh, yes, I have, yes. Um, their intersection is empty.
And so now, of course, we have that x is going to be outside of bxy. Now, here's the point. If we take the union of all of the elements of x, sorry, all the elements of our space, which are not equal to little x, and we take the bxy's around there, well, that's going to be a union of open sets. So that's going to be open. And so the complement of that has to be closed. It's a complement of an open set. But what is the complement of that? Well, if you think about it, it's just equal to the set that just contains little x, and that is closed. So for any specific element of our set, we found a closed set equal to the set that just contains that element. So our T2 space is also T1. Our topological space is T1. Okay, so we've talked about lots of things which are Hausdorff. What about something which is not Hausdorff? Well, consider the set of all integers. So we'll call that Z. Goes all the way from minus infinity, minus one, zero, one, and all the way up to infinity. Um, So, let tau be the closed finite topology. On the set of integers. And now we claim that this resulting topological space is actually not T2. And I shall leave it as an exercise for you to prove that this is the case. OK, then. So now let's carry on. And we'll talk about something else, which comes into defining the next separation axiom. So it's another definition. we say that a topological space is regular when for each closed set capital A And each point, little x, which is outside of capital A, there's going to exist a pair of open sets, u and v, such that little x is a member of u, and capital A is a subset of v and u and v do not intersect. Okay, so that's our definition of when a topological space is regular. So it's fairly non-trivial, so let's draw an example. Um, so we need that for any particular point x, and for any open set a, which doesn't contain x, we need that there are open sets 
which separate these two things. So A is, sorry, um, U is an open set which just contains X. And there's also an open set V which just contains A. And these two open sets don't intersect with each other. So that's our definition of when a topological space is said to be regular. And this gives us our next separation axiom. So when our topological space is regular and also when it's T1, so every singleton set is closed. In that case, we say that it's T3. I think there is some variation uh, between authors about the definitions of regularity in T3. OK, then, so our next result you might be able to guess is that each T3 space is, can you guess, is T2. Right, so what's the proof? Well, suppose we have a pair of distinct points, A and B in our space. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to let x equal a and we're going to let capital A equal the set that just contains B. OK, now we're assuming our space is T3, so that means it's also T1. And since the space is T1, we must have that A is going to be a closed set, because it's a singleton set. And also, since our space is regular, well then, what we're going to have for this closed set and this point which is outside of it, we must have, of course, that there exists our pair of open sets, U and V, which are going to be such that little x, or A, is a member of U and that A is a subset of V which of course implies that little b is a member of V and so and also these open sets don't intersect with each other we get that from our definition of regularity so for our pair of points we found a pair of open sets, one of which contains each point, and these two things don't intersect with each other. So, our space is going to be Hausdorff, T2. Okay then, so, as an exercise for you, I want you to consider, um, the set of real numbers with the Euclidean topology and prove or disprove the claim that that space is T3. So now I want to talk about uh, a slightly more exotic kind of topological space, which is called the Sagomfrey line. So we'll let Q, okay, um, we'll let this denote. the set of rational numbers there 
real numbers of the form a over b, where a and b are integers. And the Sagonfrey line, to define it, firstly, let's define this set here, curly b. And that's equal to the collection of all half-open intervals, which start with a real and end with a rational number. So it's the collection of all sets of reals which have the form of being the collection of all numbers which are greater than or equal to a and less than b for some real number a and some rational number b. So it turns out that this set curly b is the basis for some topology tau 1 on the reals and you can prove that and in fact um, we call this topology this topological space R tau 1 it's called the Sagonfrey line So again, three lines, sorry. Um, and now, there's a problem for you to sharpen your understanding of this. We want to show that the second three line is regular. Okay, so now we're going to work towards our fourth and final separation axiom. So to do this, let's define another notion, which is that of a topological space being normal. So we say x tau is normal if For every pair of closed sets, um, which are disjoint in the sense that they don't intersect, there's going to exist a pair of open sets which are disjoint which have the property that one of these closed sets is contained within one of the open sets and the other one's contained within the other so A is contained within U sorry A is a subset of U and B is a subset of V so, just to say it again, a topological space is normal when, given any pair of disjoint closed sets, um, one can find a pair of disjoint open sets, um, one of which contains one of the closed sets and the other one, sorry, one of which is a superset of one of the closed sets and the other is a superset of the other closed set. So, let's just draw a little diagram. Suppose we have a closed set A and a closed set B, which are disjoint. Then we can find a open set U and an open set V, which contain A and B respectively and don't intersect with each other.
that's our definition of when a topological space is normal. And now we say that, so now we get our final separation axiom. We say topological space is T4 when it is normal and also T2. Now, um, again, I've seen different definitions used here. Some people would write T1 here, and some people would even define the notion of normal differently. But I'm going with the book Topology Without Tears. So as you'd probably expect, we have that the T4 condition implies the T3 condition. So now we have the full sequence because T3 implies T2, which implies T1. Which implies T0. OK, then. Um, so one final thing to mention while we're doing this kind of topic, I may as well give you the definition of a topological manifold. Um, so we say that X tau is a topological manifold. when we have the two conditions hold. So firstly, we need that this topological space is Hausdorff. And secondly, we need that the space is locally Euclidean. So what does that mean? Well, what I mean by locally Euclidean is that for each point sorry, is that each point in X has an open neighborhood that's going to be homeomorphic to the open ball, sorry, to an open ball about the origin in n-dimensional Euclidean space for some n. Okay, so a topological manifold is Hausdorff and it has this property that every, um, this sort of neighborhood of every point kind of looks like n-dimensional Euclidean space. Now, this is like the most stripped down definition of a manifold. There are lots of extra kinds of things that you might want to add into the structure. Like you might want to insist that the topological space is connected. You might want to make it differentiable. Or you might want to add extra structure and make it into a Riemannian manifold.